I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a month. Hello everyone out there in podcast land. This is the Beyond the Mouse podcast, the podcast for all things Disney from the Front Row Network and of course our partners at NPR Illinois. And my name is Craig. I'm your host. I'm joined today by our two co-hosts, Brett Rutherford. Hello. And Vanessa Ferguson. Hello. I am in such a good mood today because we are going to have the opportunity to speak to a wonderful, wonderful person. Tom K. Morris is a former Imagineer. He worked with the Walt Disney Company for over 42 years, and now he's in the middle of writing a book on early days of Imagineering. And so we're going to ask him about all of that. He worked on so many attractions that you would know about and that you've written and that you love. And also, he built a castle. He, he built a castle. It's amazing. So he is uh, the concept artist for the castle in Disneyland Paris and just can't wait to talk to him. Brett, you have any thoughts before we get to speak to him? Um, I have questions. I have questions and I have, I want answers. I, I will ask them <laughs> as politely as possible, but yeah, I have questions. I'm very excited. He worked on an attraction called Journey into Imagination. Brett, I don't mm. know if you know about that attraction or if you're going to ask I've heard him a little it. bit. Here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa, are you excited for this? I am really excited. I always love uh, talking to these creative minds. And I'm just, there's always something really inspirational and uh, fun and interesting that comes out of them. So I'm really looking forward to this interview. Absolutely. Without further ado, Tom Morris. <laughs> We are thrilled to welcome to the Beyond the Mouse podcast at NPR Illinois Community Voices podcast, Tom K. Morris, a former Imagineer. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great today. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. So uh, Vanessa has our first question for you. You flew by yourself to the opening of Walt Disney World, and we're just going to be asking ourselves, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> why didn't we just fly to Disney as kids? But can you tell us about that experience and what is it about Disney that made you want to fly all the way to Florida? Um, I was interested in Disneyland, and I knew that they were building Disney World, although it was kind of you know, on the West Coast, it was not really um, much of a, of a news item. Um, in fact, it was kind of more like a rumor, like, you know, it's a rumor that they're building another Disneyland in Florida. And uh, Disneyland East, a lot of people would kind of call it. And then it wasn't until like the final last year, I think when the Look Magazine article came out a few months in advance, that it was like, this is a real thing. They are really building this, you know, another Disneyland, only bigger. And I just thought, I, you know, I had just started getting interested, like in the history of Disneyland, because like some of my friends, their parents had like the old guidebooks and stuff. And, you know, I'd look through some of those old guidebooks and I'm like, oh my God, you can't, you know, you wouldn't even know hardly in, in some of the photos, you wouldn't know it was Disneyland. And in some ways it was, it seemed so crude and, um, you know, just like it had grown so much that you couldn't believe that you're looking at photos of Disneyland with um, other homes kind of in the background, peeking up behind the berm, you know, and telephone poles and things like that. And um, so I, I just got this notion that, gee, you know, I'll never be able to go back in time to Disneyland on opening day. Maybe I could go to Disney World on opening day. And I was a paper boy at that time. I think I started that when I was 11 years old and um, it was right around my neighborhood. So I just started collecting, you know, saving my money um, towards a trip to Disney World and um, I didn't exactly know how I was going to do it. And my parents were kind of aware that I had this um, desire to do it. But, you know, they were kind of like, well, we won't stop you. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wild. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they even really kind of, you know, knew. I can't even remember the process of buying the... Um, 
airplane ticket or anything like that. Because back then, <laughs> it was so involved. You had to go to a travel agent, and there was lots of paper and stuff. And um, that part of it, I do not remember. But I remember finally getting enough money for the for the plane, but not enough money to stay in the hotel, which was like twenty four dollars a night. You know, for uh, the Poly Polynesian or the I can't remember if the contemporary was quite open, but the um, I think they were still working on it. They might have had a few rooms like those garden wings um, open, but at any rate, I couldn't afford the extra whatever it was plus tax um, to stay the night. Plus, it was school, I think. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what day of the week it was, but there was something that was kind of making me feel guilty that like, you know, that would be too extravagant or exorbitant, you know, to stay there. I'd never been in a hotel before. Um, you know, we had camped, but um, staying at a hotel seemed like a luxury. So I had an uncle who lived in Georgia at the time. He was on assignment in Atlanta. And he offered to, he gladly offered to, um, you know, host me at his place because it's only like an hour flight from Orlando. So that became the plan was to go to Disney World for the day and, um, and then go to, you know, fly out that night and go to my uncle's in Atlanta and um, do some sightseeing there and then return um, to L.A. in time to not miss another day of school. Wow. Yeah, I totally wow. Read off. Story. Uh, um, and, you know, I can't even remember how much the ticket was, but it was a lot of money even back then. Uh, you know, it was like $300, I think. And that was a lot of money. And, um, and I just didn't have the money, you know, to stay over. So, oh, what happened? Oh, so on my paper route, um, I mentioned to one of my customers that I was, he's, I can't remember how it came up, but I kind of recognized his name anyway. His name was Jack Sayers. And um, it turns out that he was the vice president of lessee relations at the time. He, he actually used to be kind of in charge of the whole um, park operating committee back in the earlier days. Now he was vice president of Lessee relations, and he somehow it got out that I was planning to go to Disney World. So he said, "Well, you can't, you know, just go out there by yourself. You're going to have to have someone pick you up." I'm like, "Oh yeah, you know." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that, like, oh, the airport's not right next to Disney World. Um, so he arranged for for me to be picked up at the airport, and. Um, so this whole thing actually happened and began. And I think my parents were surprised. They drove me to International, to LAX. And I was a little bit afraid at that point because I'm like, what have I gotten myself into? Um, I'm flying out f way further away than I had ever been from home. I think we had gone to Arizona and, you know, the neighboring states, but never any further than that. And suddenly I'm on this airplane on this big machine that I'd never been on before heading 3000 miles away. <laughs> and, um, hopefully there'll be someone there to pick me up. <laughs> <laughs> do you, it's do you remember a, how old you were 12. when that happened? You were 12. Yeah, 12 yeah. Wow. Yeah. I wish I did that a, at 12. <laughs> such an incredible story for that. You know, what I like about researching, uh, your story going into this interview is that you are such a fan through and through, and you've worked for WED and WDI and doing the research for your upcoming book that we want to talk about today. But I was wondering if you could take us back to your early experiences at WED. And in particular, I think you were hired on as a drafts person and you were able to work really with some of the people that we know as Disney legends and Imagineering legends and Claude Coates and Mark Davis and these names that just have such an impact for Disney fans. Can you speak to your early uh, days at WED? Sure. Um, well, the, I was hired by George Windrum, who was um, in charge of the show set design department and who goes back to 1955. Um, and 
um, the show set design department was and still is, I think, um, the department where everything kind of get, comes together and gets integrated. So information from the models, information from engineering, information from operations, it's kind of where everything finally um, uh, gets put together. And sometimes the people in show, show, des, show set design were asked to um, create designs for a model if there was um, a missing piece or something that, you know, they didn't have a model builder available. Um, sometimes we'd be called upon to create a design, but usually we were designing from the model, taking the information from the model and improving it if necessary and adjusting it as necessary. And um, that was our job. But as such, you know, we would be dealing with the art directors for each of those projects. So the first project I worked on was World of Motion. And um, that was a heck of a one to start on because of all of the Epcot pavilions, it had the most um, self-appointed art directors <laughs> and official <laughs> art directors on it. So, you know, officially Ward Kimball was an art director on it and officially Claude Coates was an art director on it and officially Mark Davis was an art director on it, but had finished his work, but then had been brought back to fill in some gaps. But then there were other individuals who thought that they um, were, if they weren't the art director, they certainly had a major um, role to play or to say in it. So I would deal with uh, maybe six or seven <laughs> different people coming by my desk. And some of them, I, I didn't know who they were. They weren't Disney legends. They were brought in just for Epcot. They were um, old time Hollywood art directors like um, Bob Clatworthy and um, Jack Martin Smith. And they were you know, like big time, uh, either MGM or 20th Century Fox Academy Award winning art directors. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, and they would kind of come in and, and um, weigh in on, and what I was doing to me was so minimal. You know, it was, it was not like a big thing. It was, uh, I was asked to design a um, pagoda and a Greek temple for the early um, trading scene where the, you know, they've invented the wheel and now there's like a used uh, chariot salesman. And um, so that was the first scene that I did. And I designed those two little buildings. Um, those designs then went to the model shop and a model builder built from those, they were pretty simple sketches. Uh, but then I was asked, I think it was by Claude. Um, well, I was asked by my boss, I think via Claude or vice versa. Um, they had, it's called a, um, I found out it's called a holiday in, in film jargon. It's a scene that they forgot to design. <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the case of an attraction, it's an area that they forgot to design, a transition kind of, you know, spot, I guess. And um, so they're going to put a scene into it. And it was the hot air balloon scene. And um, I was asked to come up with ideas for, you know, what could be done. And I was handed a bunch of um, uh, illustrations of old hot air balloons from, you know, French hot air balloons from the 18th century. And, um, and then I did, I remember, you know, going to the library and doing some research on it. And um, so I did some sketches of, of a guy, you know, in the hot air balloon, and he was with um, goats, I think. <laughs> and, um, and the hot air balloon was heading and it was flying over um, a little French village, and um, I always liked kind of half timber um, architecture. So I made it like a little half timber village, and um, mostly you just saw kind of the rooftops. And the hot air balloon was heading straight towards the steeple, and the steeple had a statue of a of a gendarme or a soldier or something on it with a a sharp um, sword 
something like that. And so the balloon was going to hit it and the goats were like trying to like warn the guy in the hot air balloon to watch out. And I think it was too, you know, too subtle. It wasn't quick, a quick enough read. So Claude said, you know, that's interesting, um, but it's a little fussy and, but he liked the buildings. So they went ahead and they, and they um, modeled the buildings that I drew up and those ended up in the attraction. And I guess they brought Mark in to do the gag scene, which was um, basically kind of an oblivious uh, guy. And, a, and I think it was a pig in the basket. I had a goat. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I went back and I found That's those funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I had this like complex that I just wasn't as good as anybody there. And I, you know, I wasn't, but I guess I had potential. Um, but I, you know, after I would do a sketch and I would get kind of a, a not an enthusiastic response to it, I just put it in a drawer or threw it away. And I looked at it, you know, I've, I've uncovered it recently. And I'm like, well, it wasn't that bad. It was actually not a bad idea either. Um, maybe there was politics involved in um, letting uh, such a young, so, you know, person who had just been there for a couple months design a whole scene. I don't know. Maybe that, that might be a little bit conceited on my part, but, um, but the sketch wasn't as bad as I thought after I had seen it. Well, Brett, I know that you have a personal connection. Well, yes. Well, Epcot. I was at Epcot on opening day and uh, out from school. Cool and <laughs> yeah, it was, it was amazing because I had followed, I had read everything that I could and watched everything and I was so excited. And so I was there. I mean, I'm in the pictures uh, of, you know, the, the throng of people that are there. I mean, I can put myself out. So that's always a good thing. That's pretty cool. But I understand, but I understand that you were at Epcot prior to October first kidding oh, okay yeah. so anyway <laughs> so you yeah. talked about world of motion and imagination pavilion yeah. but i was i was a big fan of both but especially imagination and especially journey into imagination attraction and although it didn't open on opening day when it did open and i think i might have been there shortly after it opened and it was everything we wrote it like i don't know we would get out and we would write it like, I don't know, six times because it was, it was everything I hoped it would be. And, and it still is. And I'm, I mourn that it's not there, but anyway, I was, it lives on was that? In a digital uh, iteration, <laughs> a digital iteration. Well, yeah, it needs to be a yeah virtual and it needs to, well, anyway, I've heard that it's, it's a, it's an issue. I mean, everyone still loves it, but anyway, the question that I had was what was, the imagination experience like was and was it like a rush to finish um right before uh, was it a rush to finish kind of like um the rush to finish disneyland was it kind of at that pace um elements of it were but i think it was in fairly good shape um almost ready to open were it not for the ride system being quite ready and you know some of the special effects and things like that were not quite ready probably could have been ready um, by the end of October I would say I would say the show could have been ready by the end of October um, certainly by Thanksgiving but the ride system was an issue and there were no engineers um, on hand to deal with it because there was a bigger problem and that was Spaceship Earth with the ride system there um, that had its challenges keeping it operating, um, you know. Uh, yes, well, they had someone, someone was, you were fine until the very, very end and then there was a, a wonderful person that would turn your vehicle around. <laughs> so. Right, right. <laughs> And that was that was a basic thing, but they were also trying to you know get to the bottom of several issues with it. I remember one of the issues was that there was a, a good degree of torque in the whole building when the vehicles came to an emergency stop, and um, I have to believe they accounted for that in the engineering, but it might have been more than they had um, planned. So that was another thing that they were. Um, working on it, as I recall. 
but there were but the engineers were all over either dealing with energy or spaceship earth sometimes world of motion and they couldn't really focus on um, journey into imagination until i think the beginning of the year but it's still it was well worth it so we were yeah very thankful yeah, was, for that well, it gave us plenty but, of time to get the show you know just right yeah well and of course the rest was, of the pavilion opened on opening day so magic yeah, it was great magic Dreams. Dreams was all you know was all going we had a great time so thank yeah. you for all of I that. I do think we, we need to ask, uh, and Brett, this might have been a follow-up that you had, but you uh, have been able to work with Tony Baxter so closely throughout your career. And we, of course, know all of the attractions that the, the litany of attractions and, and areas that uh, all of you were able to bring to us, especially in that second generation of Imagineers kind of led by Tony. Uh, and so can you speak to working with him on a project and, and, how, uh, and how your experience was with, with him? Well, I think it was a great experience and it's a great experience. It was a great experience because he gave everyone a, a chance. You know, he, um, he had a knack for knowing um, which people, you know, would have um, a knack for growing into a, um, a role that may not have, you know, been on the resume. <laughs> Let me put it that way. You know, I was technically just a, an apprentice draftsman. Um, but within a month, I was doing the ride layout and, and um, you know, early ideas and early uh, positioning of the sets and things like that, as well as de facto um, doing the architecture, the, the preliminary architecture for the entire building. Um, not, you know, from a official architectural standpoint, I'm not an architect. I have architectural um, knowledge and skill, but um, it's basically spatial planning. And um, th again, there was no architect available at the time because um, the Journey into Imagination Pavilion was a last minute entry to the overall schedule. And um, all the architects were you know, busy on the other pavilions. This is in 1979. And so until they could get an architect on board, we had to build models and the model builders you know, um, for certain things had to have drawings. And um, so I provided the drawings for, uh, you know, did the layout and, um, and the elevations for the attraction portion of that um, pavilion. And um, I'm trying to think, eventually they hired on Demont's Grants, who was the official architect. But the person who came up with the idea for the crystals was Dan Gouzet who did that painting behind me there. He did oh, the, wow. um, <laughs> he did the uh, painting of the, um, that you've seen, you know, the big, mm -hmm. wide, beautiful, heroic rendering of Journey into Imagination Pavilion. And his idea was that the crystals were um, silver halide crystals. And silver halide is the material that, is one of the main materials that goes into film. And so it was kind of a, you know, um, inside baseball, I guess, uh, <laughs> reference, but you know, a good one. And so I needed to interpret his, you know, design his sketches for that and make it kind of a more practical, um, building. Um, because we knew that at some point there was going to be a, you know, a, a budget reckoning. And, um, so when I was finished with that, then it was, then we got the architect, on board and I let go of the architecture, but was still involved with the uh, ride layout. And um, specifically, Tony put me, uh, wanted me focused on that whole turntable to make sure that the turntable um, was gonna be a successful uh, and magical experience. It was very important to the show, to setting up the whole idea, the premise of the show. And originally we had two turntables and that went away with the budget reckoning day. Um, <laughs> but uh, we also had a turntable for loading, uh, a loading turntable, but 
when it became a variable speed attraction, um, they determined that they could crunch the vehicles up enough um, close together in the load area that they could slow down. And at that slower speed, you could you didn't need a, a turntable and they need a speed belt. So um, I did a lot of work on that. I did kind of the, a lot of the metrics, you know, the basic, uh, you know, the figuring out vehicle speeds and spacing and um, THRC and all of that. Um, Cause I guess I knew how to use a calculator. <laughs> and luckily you did. I'm really there were some that you did. people okay. that didn't. <laughs> it's really interesting. You know, we've had a lot of discussions over this summer with uh, Floyd Norman and Bob Gurr and several others that mentioned this through line of the Walt Disney Company and, and even Walt himself um, really entrusting people to learn a new skill that maybe they don't think that they have in right. themselves. Oh, and totally. that seems like it's kind of a through line of Imagineering in particular. Yeah. Yes. And there were, you know, Tony Baxter was a big proponent of that, um, as was Claude Coates and most of the um, art directors. Um, my boss, George Windrum at the time, uh, very much believed in, um, you know, as he watched people in his department develop skill, he didn't try to hold on to them and say, I need this person. You can't have them in my department. He let them grow. Um, and so that show set design department became uh, kind of an incubator for a lot of great talent, including Robert Coltrane um, and, and many, many others um, who went on to, you know, really good careers at WDI. Yeah. Vanessa, you have a question about a large object in France that we need to ask about. Hmm, what could it be? Well, of course, you designed uh, the concept art for the Disneyland Paris castle, which is considered by many to be the most beautiful of all the Disney castles. I guess if you're going to design one, make it the most beautiful one. But um, it looks right out of a fairy tale book. So we wanted to ask you what inspired you in designing the castle. And are there any behind the scenes stories or special details that we should really pay attention to the next time we go visit? Oh, wow. It's a long, you know, drawn out story um, because I wasn't initially um, to have been involved with the design of the castle. There were already too many people that were working on it. And, um, but I knew what it was that Tony wanted. Tony was the creative lead for all of Disneyland Paris. And, you know, I, I knew his taste for this particular sort of thing. And, um, and I was just itching to, you know, do some designs because I knew I could do it. And I watched, you know, six or seven other people come up with some really fantastic and interesting designs, but I knew that they weren't going to be either what Tony wanted or what, you know, uh, people above Tony um, wanted. So uh, eventually I just started, you know, doing some sketches. But what I did was I assembled, um, I gathered up various um, storybook illustrations, um, you know, from, from different books, N.C. Wyeth. Um, Gustav Tengren, who was a background painter at Disney and a, and a concept artist back in the 30s, was always a big inspiration of mine. Um, and I put together this, you know, kind of a flavor board um, of these are the kinds of castles and this is the, the flavor that I think it should have, or this is the characteristic and the personality that it should have. And Tony bought into that, uh, really liked it. And so I went a little bit further and just, you know, started designing it and working with a model builder. And I was very, very um, cognizant to um, obey the silhouette of it, to make the silhouette very, very strong and very important um, so that it would work in silhouette, it would work as a logo, reduced in size. Um, but that came from a trip I had taken a couple years earlier to France on my own and, um, and was kind of inspired by my first visit to Mont Saint Michel, uh, which you know was an inspiring trek in itself. And the first time you see it, it's a silhouette and it's way off in the distance and it's not very defined, but it is curious looking. And the closer you get to it, the more 
um, curious and the more interesting it becomes, but it kind of still remains a silhouette until the last couple miles. And so I wanted sort of that quality, I guess, you know, I wanted it to make sure, I just wanted to make sure it had a strong, had strong bones, I guess, um, strong <laughs> forms to it. And um, so that's, you know, kind of how it happened. It's an absolutely gorgeous castle. And I, I hope to be able to see it in person someday. I haven't quite made it over there yet. Um, but speaking of another place that I haven't made it to, and these two will not let me live it down, uh, we now <laughs> wanted to ask about an attraction and actually a land that you worked on quite a bit in Disneyland. And one of the uh, most renowned themed lands in all of the Disney parks. Brett, you had a question about Cars Land. Um, I, my friend, um, Tom Turley, who worked at Disney, yeah. told me about, um, I guess, at, uh, he worked uh, on uh, Cars Land, and he yeah. was telling me, oh, and he was telling me that um, that originally it was just going to be uh, like a Route 66 sort of thing, and then Cars came out, and then Pixar became involved, and then it became a whole new thing. So can you tell me a little bit about, tell us a little bit uh, about the Cars Land experience? Sure. Um, well, as you said, um, originally it was going to be focused on California, especially Southern California car culture. And this was a concept that was created by Robert Coltrane and Kevin Rafferty. I had no involvement. I was involved with other things at the time. I think I was finishing up some work on Hong Kong Disneyland. Um, so it was something that I kind of was, um, you know, cognizant of on the periphery, but um, didn't have a lot of insight into until um, later when Cars came out. Um, then, um, and, and John Lasseter was the newly appointed um, chief creative officer for the entire company. And so he had seen that concept that Kevin and Robert had done and fallen in love with it, but wanted to make it, you know, uh, completely Cars uh, based on the film. Um, but prior to that, it was pretty cool. It was, you know, kind of that American graffiti sort of thing with a Mel's Diner sort of a, a cafe. And, um, and it did have a little race experience that was um, kind of a miniature or smaller version of the Radiator Springs Racers attraction. And um, I guess I still wasn't on it for another couple months, but Robert and Kevin basically came up with the story beats for Radiator Springs Racers. And then it was handed over to me to make into a uh, real thing, you know, it, to, to work it out, to spatially lay it out, to enhance it and, um, and optimize it in every way. And um, the biggest challenge, of course, was to create, to do placemaking where you weren't aware of the motels and the Hilton and the um, big power lines, Southern California Edison power lines that were directly behind Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Cars Land was going to go. And um, so getting everything lined up just right and not blowing the budget, you know, because you don't want to make something for a number of reasons. You don't want to make something too tall and too imposing um, because, uh, you know, it could cost a lot of money. And it also diminishes the feeling of magic if it gets, you know, too overpowering. So I worked on um, different layouts for it and, and provided the model shop with um, a multitude of drawings of how this, how the rocks and everything could basically be uh, laid out and, um, and then uh, focused on the interior. Um, and, you know, we had to make, do some editing, make some editing decisions. Um, but I did along with um, Kevin Rafferty and, uh, you know, some ideas were added, some other ideas were taken out, but ultimately we came out with uh, what you experience now, which is a, a winner. Okay. <laughs> so, everyone wins on out. speed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's good. It was good. Brett, and I guess our other question. Your favorite attraction, right? What, um, yeah. It, well, it's, amazing. Um, it's hard to say, <laughs> but yes, Indiana Jones adventure at Disneyland. So uh, you had worked on. I guess Splash Mountain and all of these Tomorrowland things, um, mm -hmm. and then yeah. but Indiana Jones. I mean, uh, it's I just it, worked on that a little bit. Very at the very very beginning, um, I think before Tony had come up with the idea of the 
of the basically the ride vehicle as a simulator. Uh, when I was working on it, it, it wasn't that yet, um, but it was a Jeep. I think I did the first vehicle designs for it. And then, um, but the, the idea that I was working on had branching systems so that, that, you know, they ended up with the illusion of three different, you know, tracks that it could take. But I was working on a version that actually, you know, had a split and then each split had a split. So there were four. Oh, wow permutations and um, I was really you know it was something I was passionate about because variability to me is you know a lot of people push interactivity um, but I for me variability um, is more interesting because you ex you experience basically the same thing but in slightly different ways so it isn't exactly the same th thing every time you go and uh, but it was you know it just wasn't ready yet and um, and it probably would have required with the Jeep, it would have required um, a much larger building. Um, so I think uh, it was it was an idea that was made more for smaller, simpler vehicles. Whatever your contributions are, we thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> And we also want to go back and talk a little bit more about Cars Land. Um, we loved learning about it, even loved visiting it even more, Craig. Um, you should go see it. But, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, I found it really interesting that your fellow Imagineer, uh, Kevin Rafferty, who you mentioned, um, felt such separation anxiety when the project was over. And I wanted to ask you, have you ever felt that way oh, yeah. about any, any project you've worked on? Which ones uh, got yeah. you the most? Oh, well, the big ones, you know, the um, Disneyland Paris, certainly. Um, I think imagination was so long and drawn out. There was no separation anxiety there because it was you know um it was finally like bye bye okay. imagination <laughs> that well i was the last um imagineer standing on that and so you know everyone went home uh after the opening and i was the one um left out there until that ride got opened um because i was also doing a lot of troubleshooting on the image works and uh various other um little problems that might have cropped up uh, elsewhere in um, Epcot. I, I remember working closely with Tom Turley at the time. Oh, really? Tom was, oh, Tom sure, was yeah. the, um, the PICO coordinator and then became the area supervisor for the land pavilion and also for Journey into Imagination. And so I worked with him on getting some of the crowd flow and graphic and directional issues worked out um, that first month or two. So um, no separation anxiety there, although I, I kind of missed, you know, Florida was kind of sad to leave after I had been there for a year because um, I was living in the campground <laughs> and it was nice. Oh, yeah. and, <laughs> you still couldn't and, afford the poly, huh? <laughs> no, and I, and I didn't, you know, back then I didn't require much, you know, to be happy. <laughs> so all, you know, the trailer was just fine with me. And, you know, I loved all the wildlife and nature. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was a hiking trail and a jogging trail and um, all of that. It, it was really wonderful. So that I really missed. Um, but then I think the next big one had to have been... Um, Disneyland Paris, and there was definitely some separation anxiety there. And at Hong Kong Disneyland, there was definitely some uh, separation anxiety. And it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of like the last day of school, but mixed in with I didn't finish my assignment. Am I, you know, it's not, com it's not finished. <laughs> There's lighting. Well, Walt said it'll never be finished. So you can take right. it from him. So, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, but oftentimes away. there's a punch list, you know, and, and you get very um, passionate about making sure that that punch list gets done because the fear is if you um, leave, no one else is as passionate about that punch list as you are. And, you know, I, you know sometimes there's important things that may seem frivolous um, but aren't, you know, that they're, 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 they're little adjustments that make it uh, more meaningful or funnier or more poignant. Um, 
And so I know exactly what Kevin means by that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And we also mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about Kevin. He, he seems like such a fun and kind of silly guy is at least that's how he came across to us. Is that really what he's like, you know, working yeah. with him? <laughs> well, he's, wow. um, he's, but he's also serious, you know, he's, he has a serious knowledge of the business, but he knows that if um, you're not having fun in the process of creating magic and entertainment and fun, how do you expect the product to, you know, be fun if you're not having fun while you're doing it? So, um, and maybe because we both went to Cal State Fullerton, maybe there was some juju there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Because <laughs> we're both and kind he, of goofy. <laughs> or yeah, we, he has a goofy. wonderful book, uh, Magic Journey, and I think that's a great transition yes. point to say that uh, you yourself are also working on a book. And we, we could talk about your attractions. We didn't even touch Hong Kong Disneyland too, too much. And uh, we would, you know, just love hearing these stories about the attractions you worked on. But you're also uh, heavily featured in the Imagineering story and you're working on your own book and we want to make sure we ask about both those things. So Brett, uh, could you uh, lead us into the Imagineering story and to yeah. his book? We Disnoids, as I, I affectionately call serious Disney fans, um, Disnoids, um, we get to take a deep dive in the Imagineering story and that just is, you know, scratching the surface for what she has plans for, hopefully. We, we didn't ever get an answer. She's, she said, well, we spoke with Leslie earlier this summer and she said that she would uh, allow uh, Disney to make that announcement. So there were no spoilers <laughs> there. But your book, we can't wait to learn more because we know about kind of the superstars or the real the Disney legends but there's so many other people and it sounds like you're going to be giving a little, us a little bit more information about the superstars and the Disney legends but other people too that were part yeah. of Disney Imagineering. Um, it, it was a book that I accidentally stumbled into um, that immediately got a lot of enthusiasm when I mentioned it um, as an idea. And what I was working on was an archaeology of Disneyland idea, um, basically based on a lot of information and material I had gathered over uh, my 35 years or so at Imagineering. And there was some interest from, or there was interest from Disney publishing on it, but you've got to get in the queue there and you got to keep knocking on the door and which I was doing, but then it got postponed um, for a year or two, which was all fine. But in the process of doing my research for that, I kept coming upon, oh, I've never seen this before. I've never heard this before. I've never heard this story. I've never heard of this person. I've never seen this person. Oh, that's what they're doing in this photo that I've seen so many times. And that's who the other person is in that photo. And concurrently, I was like, I went to a Ryman Arts fundraising event and it was at this person's house. Her name was Tanya McKnight. I had never heard of Tanya McKnight, um, Tanya McKnight Norris. But at the time at Disney, she was Tanya McKnight. Never heard that name ever. And her house, all the walls were covered with Herb Ryman and Mark Davis and Roly Crump, you know, artwork. And, you know, so I started talking with her and sure enough, you know, she goes back to around 1963 or 64 and worked very closely with Dorothea Redmond and the late Bob Brown on the interiors for New Orleans Square, um, worked on the Haunted Mansion, but was in the same kind of circle of people as some other names <laughs> that I had just run across. And then she was providing additional names and I'd go back to the archives and I'd do some deep diving and, oh yeah, these names all add up, they check out. Um, one of the names was Ted Rich. Ted Rich was a name that was given to me a couple months before I met Tanya uh, by Glenn Durflinger, who I had lunch with and shortly before, unfortunately, he passed away about a month later. But I asked him, I said, you know, I always have wanted to know who really designed the castle in Florida, the beautiful Cinderella castle. Was it Bill Martin or was it Herb Ryman? 
or, you know, was there someone else? Um, and he said, yeah, there was someone else. His name was Ted Rich. And he was the one who designed that castle because Glenn had worked on that castle. It was one of his first projects. I think he was the job captain on it. And Glenn has no, um, you know, um, dog in any race. You know, he, he could have said it was me. His name is on half the drawings. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but he said, no, uh, it was, you know, Bill Martin is the architect on record, but Bill was so busy with so many other things. Um, and Bill, I'm sure, provided uh, valuable input to it as he did with the Disneyland castle. But he said the, you know, the bulk of that castle was a guy named Ted Rich, and wow. who also was the one who designed all the facades for New Orleans Square. Mm. And then a month later, I'm talking with Tanya McKnight, and she brings up Ted Rich as the designer of the castle. So I'm like, okay, well, that's corroboration for me. <laughs> uh, you know, sure. and I've since uh, done some deep diving on it, and, and it all pans out, except there's very little information about Ted Rich. Um, so anyway, long story short, I guess that's impossible. Um, Still. These rabbit holes keep going on and on with this particular book project. I'm in the process of wrangling it right now to see, okay, how big is this? I, I kind of stopped the research for the moment and am doing a mock-up of the book just so I know how many you know, pages this thing has turned into. But long story short, there's a whole imagineering story that we still haven't heard um, that goes back to 53. We've heard the highlights of it in the imagineering story and in you know, some books, but we have very little um, visual uh, insight into it or, or a detail insight as to where they were doing this work um, who was collaborating with who, who were all the players, you know, we've heard all of the kind of the same names over and over. And I expected, I think someone at one time um, told me, you know, WED never was more than 70 people. And so I'm thinking there's 70 people between 1953 and 1961 when they moved to Glendale and then the World's Fair happens and that's when they onboard additional people like Rolly Crump and Mark Davis. And so I've got 70 stuck in my mind and I start, you know, doing the deep research and it turns out there's a lot more, <laughs> you know, there's uh, probably two or 300 up to 1961. And some wow. of them, some of them are just, I, you cannot get any information on, but a lot of them went on to bigger things and became mm -hmm. um, Oscar awarded or nominated art directors, Emmy uh, awarded or nominated art directors, art directors guild members, lifetime achievement members. Um, wow. And wow. Uh, uh, so there's plenty to talk about. Well, and, there's an audience for all of it. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. sure. I keep, asking, I keep like going, well, me and four others, maybe. No. Yeah. Well, you have at least three right here. So <laughs> you have at least three. Oh, and the, the question I'm that mine. I have, let's see. Um, I do have white gloves, and I'm asking if I may join you at uh, the Disney Archives sometime. Just, you know, <laughs> just as a guest That's for the day the or an hour. Archives. Um, I, uh, you know, right now they're closed because of the pandemic. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of provided a good time for me just to scoop everything up that I've um, gotten so far. Uh, they provide such a wonderful service. And um, I think it is true that nothing was ever thrown out. But, um, you know, Dave Smith only had so much time. And Becky now, um, who has succeeded him, you know, only have so much time and, and so much real estate uh, that they've got to cover. Uh, I'm certain there's still a lot of things that are still floating uh, out there. And... Um, I know there's a lot more footage than you so, you've seen in the Imagineering story. It was amazing. Uh, that's not under so the archives. Um, the, the archives is not in charge of that footage, but um, I have reason to believe that there is, that you've only seen a small percentage wow. of it. I hope we get to see more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and some of that footage is in the old wet office. You know, some of the footage that was actually in the... Um, in the imaginary story. And what's kind of funny is that I remember asking people, 
um, back in the day when I was trying not to be too nerdist. Um, you know, where was where was WED when it was at the studio? And I think, you know, when I started working on some D23 um, expo projects that had to do with um, imagineering legacy and that sort of thing, you know, I did start gathering materials for that. And that's maybe, you know, also kind of the seed of, of the idea for this book when that happened. But I remember asking Marty and Orlando Ferrante, you know, where was the WED office? And I always heard, uh, the reply always seemed to be, well, there was no office. Um, they were scattered about the studio. So the individual people were in their individual offices in the animation building or the ink and paint building or wherever. And there was no formal WED office. Machine shop, you know, was doing their thing. And, um, but that turns out not to be true. There was an office, very definitely. And Marty couldn't have told me that because I read an interview with him recently. And, you know, he, even he mentions the office in the animation building. So, um, but I think what happened was that when WED moved from the studio in 1961 to Glendale, there was kind of uh, information cut off, a, a memory cut off. And a lot of people stayed at the studio. They didn't want to go to Glendale. They didn't want to give up their union memberships um, if they had them. There were a lot of, you know, kind of pension related reasons why some people didn't want to make the switch. And so I think a lot of those people became forgotten because they just, they weren't um, perpetual. They weren't there all the time. And so they weren't, you know, in your memory. And so your memory starts to overwrite your, your more recent memory begins to overwrite the older memory. And so thus three or four other people in the model shop have been forgotten in the early model shop, a couple of women and, um, and a couple other individuals who were there in 54, 55 and 56. And um, we've never heard about them. And gosh, with the, uh, the drafting team is an assortment of architects, all of whom, um, all of whom came from the motion picture studios. Mm -hmm. Only a small percentage of WED was from the Disney studio. Yeah. And, um, and it took 100 WED designers to design Disneyland. And of those 100, maybe 12 were from the studio. We just uh, we just talked about twenty thousand leagues under the sea. So to, to see those connections in that early oh, wedding. Yeah. Well, there's a big connection, really not just with Harper Goff, um, but they took the entire team of draftspeople from twenty thousand leagues and moved them into wed. And there was a really great another very skillful, um, I would say, designer uh, named Fr Freddie Stoos, who actually did all the cleanup design for the Nautilus. So. Harper's, if you look at Harper's original model, you know, of course it's really cool, but you know, a, a good designer takes a design and makes it even better and even sexier, you know? And so that's what this guy did with the uh, Nautilus. And then there was another guy who worked on the interior of the Nautilus um, and, and did the bulk of that work. And all those people were um, then brought into WED because it just worked out conveniently when the production wrapped on 20,000 leagues um, that they all just, uh, they were all up on the third floor and they just walked downstairs to the first floor into the wet office and were there for, uh, you know, a year or so. And, and most of those were, were old um, seasoned um, people. Probably most of them came from Warner brothers uh, where Harper Goff was. He probably um, pulled them over. I well, I think it for as you. Fans, <laughs> as, as fans, it's so nice to have people that are preserving that history, whether it's Leslie Iwerks in the Imagineering story talking about your story, or it's you doing this work for the early Imagineering, because it's so great to be able to find these stories and these people and these passions that bring about life to something that we all cherish within the Disney parks and the Disney company. Yeah. Brett's got a, uh, Brett's has a, um, some rapid fire questions for you now, oh, and then okay. Vanessa will wrap us up. Okay. I mean, these are just, I mean, just these are just curiosity. fun. These are just fun. Marty Scalar's famous notes. Did you ever get one? Did you keep absolutely yeah. every one of them? Oh, no. <laughs> I've got them. 
Oh, yeah. my God. I actually have a whole file that I haven't gone through yet. Um, from, you know, I eventually, it gets very cumbersome to be <laughs> uh, moving these files around from office to office. Um, and I must have had two dozen different offices in my career. And at some point you just go, why, you know, you just throw out a bunch. And um, unfortunately, so, but I still have um, quite a few memos from um, mid nineties, I think, up, uh, that, that involve the um, post opening of Disneyland Paris and then also Hong Kong Disneyland. And um, so there's a lot of notes on memos, a lot of memos, and then, um, you know, most of which I won't ever be able to print, not because there's anything, you know. Uh, Those are personal. Those are your treasures, my gosh. Right, How right. Cool. And also they're, you know, they're still technically uh, property of the Disney right. company. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I have to get permission for every um, sure. of those, but I do have a lot of the single note cards. Yes, yeah, that's <laughs> and so I, haven't, cool. I haven't, um, I haven't corralled them all yet because they're kind of in different places, right? Now. Yeah. Well, that wasn't really a quick, fi rapid fire, but it, I still wanted to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my last okay. memory of Marty was at the D twenty three Expo, and I saw him. Um, he was in an autograph. He was at the, I think he was at the Ryman, um, the Ryman Arts booth. And he was signing his book and he was signing it with a blue pen for the first time. And oh thought, That's yeah. That's really interesting. You know, I want a blue pen Marty. <laughs> big long line and I wasn't going to cut in. And I was wow. going to say, you know, hi Marty. And I thought, no, I don't, I don't want to bother him. Right. And that was the last time I saw him. Mm, yep. Okay. Some other um, rapid fire, quick fire. Um, what's your favorite attraction? I guess I still like Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. You know, I mean, it's what ignited my um, interest in, in Imagineering as an art form. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but there's other attractions that certainly, uh, you know, I appreciate as, you know, kind of the high um, watermark of the art form, you know, the Radiator Springs Racers, and Rise of the Resistance, and um, you know, gosh, there's so many. I, I love the Avatar Land. Um, so it's, it's so it's very hard, but I do. <laughs> it's I, so but I benchmark. I, I guess I use Pirates of the Caribbean as a benchmark because I the length of it, the fact that you're so um, geographically and spatially turned around in it, and also how time slows down while you're in it. Um, so there's something that's kind of magical uh, about it. There's, there's a certain alchemy to it that I like to study and mm -hmm. compare against other attractions. Um, I, wish, I wish there was more variability in the scene. So I'm maybe a little bit of a heretic. Um, not that I would, you know, I, I just would like to, hear some different lines in there um, or see different situations from time to time and not see exactly the same thing. Well, you uh, might see John, Johnny Depp in there, the way he right. used to pop in <laughs> on occasion. So That's right. Um, so, you know, those changes don't bother me. But what I would really like to see is, is you know, there's three different ways you know, some, maybe some of these things, maybe some of these little setups are on turntables so that you see different figures um, doing different things as you go through. Not a lot, it doesn't have to all be different, but just enough where, oh, I've never seen that before. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that's what that attraction needs to, you know, kind of push it ahead. But it's still, you know, I guess it's still my favorite. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then a real, just a really quick one. Um, do you have a favorite Disney park snack? Snack? Yes, the oh. Disney Park snack. <laughs> this is a long, snack. ongoing debate. I'm sorry, we're, really we won't, we're not really going to get into it, but whatever uh. you say is perfect, <laughs> uh, as long as it, you don't say. <clears throat> well, I remember at, the one that stands out in my mind as being most unique was something that's not there anymore at Walt Disney World in Tomorrowland. They had this kind of space punch or something. I can't remember what it was called, but it was peach flavored. Oh, oh uh -huh. it was a peach okay. like nectar. I think it was provided 
by Minute Maid or some company um, that was a sponsor that had all of the juice in the park. Huh. Um, but it wasn't branded. It was just space punch or space, space punch. punch. Uh, <laughs> that sounds great. And they should the bring it back. Punch. Okay. It was they really good. Do. And and every time I take that flavor hits me, I go back to Walt Disney. Wow. That's cool. I, I That's can good. imagine drinking that after eating a turkey leg. Just sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> we have a turkey leg That's debate. The, yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. I wasn't even going to go there because it's yeah. just a little. I, <clears throat> I didn't say anything about it being better. I just mentioned that it's okay. an item. I do well, like the um the I have to say I like the corn dogs at Disneyland. Oh, that's sir! Good. But uh, that's kind of a recent little red wagon. Yeah, but it's a uh, recent discovery of mine um, because I kind of avoid corn dogs as you know yeah. kind of junk food thing. Um, but recently, uh, probably thanks to Marcy's book, um, I've rediscovered the you know the beauty and the wonder of the Disneyland corn dog. <laughs> and so that's probably currently my favorite, but I have to make sure cool. I've been on a good diet prior to that so that I can. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> it is very right. good. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, we have one final question for you. And uh, the question is, two of the attractions that you worked closely with Tony Baxter on have made some news recently. And I just wanted to ask your thoughts on the Splash Mountain re-theme and also Tony's comments that he would come out of retirement to redo, uh, redo Journey into Imagination. Would you be willing to help in that effort if asked? Oh, of course, <laughs> if asked, yes, definitely. <laughs> I hope that happens. And I'm all for the Splash Mountain change because uh, Tony and I worked on that at the very, we were the two people that um, brought that idea out before it then expanded on to um, John Stone who gave it, you know, so much magic and Bruce Gordon who was the producer on it. But for several months, it was just me and Tony um, trying to figure out where to fit it, you know, where it would physically fit in the park and then also how it should be themed. And we landed on um, Zippity Doodah because of the music, you know, um, it, we felt it was important, like it's a small world and Pirates of the Caribbean that it be musically driven. And the music um, and the various songs from Song of the South happened to give you, you know, gave you kind of that three part opera um, that is, you know, I think a necessary element for a long attraction for an e-ticket attraction. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason we chose Splash Mountain. We probably considered briefly the rescuers because it took place, you know, in a bayou swamp, but it just didn't, you know, it didn't have the music. It didn't have the characters. Um, although it had Evan rude, but um, it just didn't seem to have the characters that were required. And it really wasn't an issue back, you know, at that time. And no one was, you know, talking about uh, Uncle Remus um, as a part of the story. It was just the three Brer characters and, um, you know, the, the exploits and the, um, and the business, basically, that you could get into. Uh, you could, you know, create some drama and some suspense with those three characters and the music from the film. And that's the only reason we chose that. Um, and it worked, but I think the princess and the frog would work just as well. And it's, you know, the same setting. I don't think really much has to change. I wouldn't change the exterior of it um, because I think it's, you know, it doesn't want to overpower the haunted mansion too much. It wants to just be a natural looking. I don't think anyone looks at that mountain and says uncle Remus. So um, I'm all for the change. I think it, you know, I think that music is great. I think the characters are great from that film. And I think it will be just as good, if not better. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for not only, like I said, your, your uh, fandom that you made into this wonderful career with the Disney company. And then now you're giving us fans something to look forward to in your book. And you're retelling those stories of people that may have been forgotten to time. And it's so important to do that work. We could ask you, we could spend hours and hours with you, I'm sure. And it's so exciting that we will get a chance with the, uh, with the book. 
Yeah, I'm hoping to wrap it up as soon as I can. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely reached the scope of the book and it's kind of now in the in editing down i have to figure out who i'm not going to talk about basically um because of you know there's some people that uh, i i'll have to belong to fbi i guess or something to figure out who they were or <laughs> where they came from um, they're on twitter i don't know <laughs> facebook no sorry maybe <laughs> well the thing i think the nice thing about the book is it will name everyone and when they work there and if people have a curiosity about that person, they can begin their own, um, you know, uh, search, you know, deep dive and find out what exactly, especially these, the ones from 20,000 leagues, because of the, of the 10 that worked on 20,000 leagues, I think we only know, I only have information on four of them. So there's six mystery names. I only know that they, you know, worked on a film prior to that so they came from the studios but there's no biographical information on them uh whatsoever wow just incredible just yeah. the, the work that you're doing thank you for that and really thank you for your time today you're very welcome thank you to the walt disney company for you know all the good years and for imagineering for all of the for you know giving me a chance and um you know i think there's a lot more to come absolutely a fantastic interview with Tom Morris. Thank you so much to Tom for spending an hour of his time with us and really going through nearly his entire career uh, in terms of years, but he worked on so many more attractions and we didn't even get to scratch the surface on things like Hong Kong Disneyland. He also, what I love about him is that he truly is a fan. He was a fan from the time that he was a child and going to Disneyland and then boarding a plane by himself at 12 years old to go and see Walt Disney World on opening day. He's a fan through and through, just like us. Vanessa, your thoughts on Tom? Oh, I just thought he was just really cool. I loved his stories. I love that he just, like you said, flew to Disney World all by himself and his parents were like, well, go ahead. I mean, do we not have parents like that? Or are we just not brave enough to think of that by ourselves, <laughs> flying to Disney World anytime we wanted when we were kids? But I know the next time um, I go to a park, I'm going to be looking for his work. And definitely when we go to Disneyland Paris, we'll be looking at that castle going, you know, I talked to the guy who designed this. I, yeah, I did. I talked to him. I talked to him. So I'm really excited for that. He was just a, a great person to talk to. I hope we get to talk to him again. Absolutely. I could talk uh, all day with him about Disney history and just some of the, uh, he, he got into it a little bit about the Imagineers, but I cannot wait to just devour that book when it comes out. And something else too, I follow him on Twitter and uh, Twitter generally is a dumpster fire, but Tom K. Morris on Twitter makes your day better because he shares so many great pictures of Disneyland and uh, some of his past work. So definitely follow Tom. I know he's also on Instagram as well, but he uh, does most of his work, I think, he posts on Twitter. So check out those pictures there and just enjoy some of that nostalgic Disney. Brett, talk to me about the interview and your thoughts. I got my answers and so I'm happy. Thank you. I <laughs> know he was great to talk to and certainly gracious with his time and I can't wait until we get to read his book number one and talk to him again. So yeah. can't wait. And Tom if you're listening back just thank you so much. Uh, we can't wait uh, to be able to read that and then also hopefully get the opportunity to speak with you again. It was just such a wonderful uh, opportunity that we had and thank you Again, just thank you, thank you for all of the wonder and joy you bring into our lives through Imagineering. Any final thoughts for either of you before we wrap this thing up? Well, I know when Tom redoes uh, Journey into Imagination, Brett would like to be Dream Finder. So, Tom, please, please have him come and be your, your, your live actor. Your muse. You could be the Dream Finder muse, Brett. <laughs> 
The dream. He's I even, am the dream. He's finder. even wearing his dream finder blue. So there you go. <laughs> I was a little And I'm wearing my Epcot yeah. shirt. I wore my, my yeah. Epcot shirt today. So your video audience, you get to see that. But thank that you great. so much for listening to Beyond the Mouse. We are so excited to have you. And if this is the first time you're listening, please continue to like and subscribe and listen to all of our past episodes. We just spoke to Jody Benson. And that episode just aired on our podcast feed last week. So go back and for sure, check that out. You can find Beyond the Mouse at all of our social media, uh, Beyond the Mouse podcast on Facebook, also Beyond the Mouse pod on Instagram. And uh, of course, we are part of the Front Row Network. You can find them on all of their social media as well at the Front Row Network. And then on Twitter, Front Row Reviews with a Z. If you want to really class up your podcast feed, you can find us as well on nprillinois.org. And we are grateful for that partnership as well. Of course, grateful for you and grateful for these wonderful guests that we've had and looking forward to what we're going to present you in the future. Uh, And we're going into the Halloween season. It's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you again for listening. For Beyond the Mouse, I am Craig. I'm Vanessa. And I'm Brett. And we will see you real soon in the front row. Maybe going through a Disney castle. Let's go. <laughs> it has a dragon with us. Could you From imagine Paris, walking Disneyland through the castle a... with Tom? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I just need someone to speak I just want French to get the me. white gloves and, and go to uh, the archives. Okay. Ooh, I, I do that too. Let's do both. Let, why are we limiting ourselves? I'm pretty sure he's in California. Let's just have him come and meet us at Disneyland and 